but it was never ever God's intention for anybody to be an island, to be, to live in isolation. Animals. He made more than just one of each. When he chose to make the human family, he made male and female to come together in one flesh. And so God, in our uniqueness, builds us. Builds us, first of all, as an individual. Adam has his characteristics. Eve had her characteristics. The combining of those characteristics built a family. Built a family. And that family built a nation. That family populated the world. And so first of all, the first lesson that I want to talk about is to the children. So boys and girls, I would like you few people here in the front seat to just go sit somewhere else. And I want the young children, say under the age of 12 or 13, to come and to sit into these seats and be like big people. Okay? So can we ask, well, it, well if they'll all fit here, that's fine. Okay? All the boys and girls, come up here. Because for a moment, you're the most important people here. Okay? Because I'm going to spend some time talking with you, boys and girls. And the reason why I want to do that is because God talks to you. Now, there's a little one over here that's too young to be here, so I want mum or dad to bring the little one. If there's any other children that, that are too young to be here on their own, I want mum and dad to bring them. So there's more coming. There's more coming. Let's make room. Okay? Now, I'm going to take a story from the Bible, okay? And this story comes from Samuel, okay? The first book of Samuel, okay? Now, have you ever heard God talking to you? Okay? Has God ever said anything to you? Okay? Because, you know, one day God is going to talk with you and God is going to say things with you. And although there's words in this book and in this Bible that we can read, God still also wants to be able to talk to us. Now, Samuel was a little boy. He was only three years old when his mum and his dad took him to the temple and left him at the temple because his mummy had made a promise that he was going to be one of God's workers, one of God's people. And I'm going to share with you the little story about Samuel, okay? And you ready? The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. Now, Eli was the priest, okay? So I'm the pastor. Eli, Eli was a priest. He looked after the temple. I'm the pastor that looked after the church. And Eli, Eli was there to look after Samson. We might have to make one of you shift over here soon. Okay. You don't want me to do that. Are you friends? Okay. Your brothers? Why are you doing that to your brother then? Hey? We might have to make one brother sit on the other end of the seat soon. Okay. Now, one day, Eli, who was going blind, was, li was lying in his room. So he'd gone off to have a sleep. And before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and then the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here I am. 
And he ran down to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. See, when God first spoke to Samuel, Samuel didn't recognise that it was God interested in him. He thought it was Priest Eli. So he ran all the way down to Priest Eli's room and Priest Eli said, "Uh uh-uh, I didn't call you. And then it goes on again in verse 6, it said, and once again, the second time, the second time, it says the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and he went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Eli says, no, I didn't call you. Go back, go back to bed, go back to sleep. Now Samuel had not experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. But in verse 8 it says, Once again, for the third time, three times, the Lord called out Samuel. And he, w- he got up and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Eli says, No, I didn't call you. And he told him to go back. But you know what? We're told that Eli understood that it was God that was wanting and talking to Samuel. And so Eli said to Samuel, you go back, you lie down, and if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Nice and quiet, waiting, waiting. And then we're told the Lord came, stood there and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded, speak for your servant is listening. You know, sometimes people called us, people talk to us, but we don't always understand what's going on. And so we run to our mums and we run to our dads or we run to our teachers and we say, what did you say? Did you want me? And sometimes, yes, they do, they want to, they want to tell you something. But I want to say that there is somebody more important in the world than your mum and dad, than your brothers and sisters, and than your teachers, and that is God. And I want to be able to say to you that God, right now, is building your future. He's helping you to build your life. That's why you come to church with mum and dad. You don't just come to church because they tell you to come to church. But you come to church because it's a place where you can hear about God, you can learn about God, you can listen about God and get to know that God because one day that God's going to say and talk to you. And it might be that he might say, Oh, I think you'll be a good teacher when you were thinking about being a mechanic. Or he might say, oh, I think you'd make a good doctor when you were only thinking about a nurse, being a nurse. Because sometimes God's ideas and dreams for us are bigger than our own dreams, but he knows what's right. You know, one day, I wasn't a little boy, but one day God told me to go to the Solomon Islands. And I said, no. I'm not going to the Solomon Islands. What would I want to go there for? I don't know anyone. But for three weeks, God kept on saying, oh, you are going to the Solomon Islands. And I kept on saying, no. And then one day, I met a man who had been advertising for someone to go to the Solomon Islands. And I was talking to him by accident. And God arranged our meeting 
And I said to him, have you found a person to go to the Solomon Islands yet to look after the big sawmill that you want to be looked after? And he says, no. And I said, you know what? I said, God's been telling me to go. So if you want me, I'll go. And so I did. And I had four really good years in the Solomon Islands. I had a lot of fun there. So boys and girls, God's not just interested in the big people, okay? He's interested in you as well. And he wants to help you to grow up, to grow up, to grow up, to be built in the image of God so that you can help God and you can help him with his work and grow up a people that love God and worship God. So boys and girls, that's your part of the story. Thank you for being good boys and girls. Make sure, make sure your ears are always clean, okay? Make sure they're always clean so that you can hear God when he calls your name, okay? God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Right now, I want all the ladies to come and sit in the middle. Men, help, ladies, it's your turn. And that's from, from the age of any that were up the front here to the oldest. Every lady in the middle, men, don't want you men, move over to the side, men. Your turn's coming. Move over to the side, men. Come on, men, I see a couple of men still sitting in the back. Move over to the side. This is the ladies. This is the ladies. Don't worry, guys. You're coming next. Okay? Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. No, there's none out there. None over there. Thank you, ladies. Ladies, I'm going to stay in the next... I'm going to stay in the first two chapters of the book of Samuel to just help you to understand how important your role is in building a people of God. And I believe that, that your, your function in life is God gifted, is God ordained. But in Samuel, we learn what your role really is. It's not cooking. It's not knitting. It's not sewing. That's, that's like, okay, how can I explain this? Okay. Drinking alcohol, smoking a cigarette, that is not sin. That is an action of sin. That is sinful behaviour. Sin is stepping outside of a relationship with God, is ultimately what sin is. And when you step outside of that relationship with God, then you will start to do those little things and they grow into big things and all of a, self, all of a sudden you find yourself separated from God. So being the best cook is not being the best person for God. Being the best dressmaker is not being the best person for God and not being built up for the work of God. It is part of it, but it's not the essence of it. In Samuel chapter 1, we learn what the essence of womanhood is and of what being a mother is. And you know the story well. There was this man, Elkanah. He had two wives. He was asking for trouble from the start. He had two wives. One was productive, the other was not. 
And it come, we come to the point in the story where Hannah was not able to have a child. And for her, that was a death sentence. In the culture in which she grew up, that was a death sentence. It was not good to be barren. It was not good to be a mother at the time that the scriptures here were written. And she was tormented, she was ridiculed, she was ostracized, if you like. Her life was turned into a life of misery. And so she turns to the only person that can help her. She turns to God. And when we come to verse 7 of chapter 1, it says, Whenever she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way every year. And Hannah wept and would not eat. So yeah, she was being greatly troubled. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah asked. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Ooh, that really hurt her. A husband was someone special, but in their culture, a son. A son was special. A son was vital. And a son made her somebody. And so at this point in time, she has, she has, she has, she feels like she is nobody. And even her husband, although he loves her immensely, has even made her feel more ashamed. And so it says that Hannah got up after they ate and drank. At Shiloh, Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's tabernacle, deeply hurt. Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. There is the essence of womanhood, right explained in that text. The expression of womanhood is brought to us in this text, deeply hurt. Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. It's only when you are able to go to this place that Hannah goes to and surrenders all and everything to God that Hannah is able to be blessed and you will be able to be blessed. If you have not let go of everything and given everything to God, you will have challenges in your life. You will have difficulties in your life. Sure, we still experience them with God when we are with God, but we can deal with them better when we have totally surrendered and giving everything to the Lord. Now, at this point, Hannah does something. I don't know if I could be this bold. I don't know if I could be as bold as Hannah is being here, but we're all encouraged to be as bold as this. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of hosts, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forgive me and give your servant a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. Wow. Wow. She has come to this point where she realises that the Lord is everything in her life. And even if the Lord honours her, with the blessing of a son, she is immediately going to devote that back to God. Ladies, have you devoted 
everything that God has given you back to him? Have you given everything that God has given back to him? The husband that he gave you, have you given him back to God? The children that God has given you, have you given them back to God? The material blessings that you have, have you given them back to God? Because this is what Hannah does. This is what Hannah does. She gives everything that God gave her back. And of course, they think she's stupid. They think she's drunk in making this commitment. They think it's inappropriate behaviour to be carried away in the spirit of God to make that surrender. But Hannah does. She doesn't care that they mock her, that they think that she is drunk. In verse 15 she says, No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I'm not drunk, God. I'm just, I'm just suffering of a broken heart. There are things that I want that I haven't got. There are things that I need that I haven't got. God, I know only you can provide them. God, I know only you can meet those needs. God, if you give them to me, I'll give them back. God, I will serve you. And this is what Hannah is saying here. She never loses her son. Yes, she gives her son. Every year she makes him a special coat. Every year she takes him and gives him a special coat. Samuel is still her son. She's never lost her son. And she becomes, no doubt, the very proud mother of a very wonderful son. A son gifted by God, a son returned to God, a son nurtured to God. But do you know that for three years after the birth of her son, she never took Samuel to the temple because she knew that she had a role to play. She knew that Eli's household was not a perfect household. It was an evil household. But Eli was the priest. Eli was the one that she was to give her son to, to care for. And his sons were drunkards, evil individuals. So she spent three years nurturing her son to be a child of God, to know what was right, to know what was wrong, to do the right things. That's why when he was eight, nine, ten years old, God called him because God knew that he was a young man who could be trusted because Hannah grew her son, built her son into a building of God. Ladies, I challenge you today to be that person, to be that woman, to be that woman who, 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 like Hannah, has a broken heart. I'm sure there's, there's, there's not one of you today that in some ways heart is not breaking. Give that brokenness to the Lord. Surrender that brokenness to the Lord. It says here in verse 22, After the child is weaned, I will take him to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. And when she had weaned him, she took him with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bull, two and one and a half gallons of flour and a jar of wine. Though the boy was still young, she took him to the house of Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the bull to Eli. First of all, Hannah honoured the Lord 
by offering the appropriate sacrifice. The appropriate sacrifice. Once the appropriate sacrifice was offered, she then gave Eli, gave Samuel to the house of God. I pray that you are mothers that make the sacrifice. I pray that you are mothers that, like Hannah, will pay the, pray that prayer that Hannah prayed. And I pray that you will be women that will make a vow to honour God with your faithfulness. May God bless you as you are built into a woman of God. May God bless you. Ladies, I'd like you to depart and I'd like the men to come to us. Just the man in the middle, just the man in the middle. Just the man in the middle. Oh. <laughs> if you are unable, we'll excuse you. But men, come to the middle. Men, there's a passage in Scripture that is perhaps one of the most powerful passages of scripture that we need to pay attention to. Men, and I'm guilty of this myself, in saying, son, do this, son, do that, Leah, do this, Emma, do that, and that's the way we go about stuff. As we are, in our role, usurp the authority that is given us and we say, do this, don't do that. But I want to take you to a passage in scripture where this very issue is dealt with. Matthew chapter 19. And you will know it. You will know it's where Jesus is talking to a rich young man. He had accumulated great wealth and he was on a journey. And here in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22, we have the story of this young man trying to justify himself, trying to say that he was okay, that everything was good with him, that he was on the right path, that he was doing the right things. And he even challenged Jesus. And the conversation starts this way. Just then, someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? What do I got to do? What do I got to do, Jesus, to, to receive the gift that you have promised eternal life? What must I do? And then Jesus gets, throws back a question. Why do you ask me about what is good? Why? Why do you ask? We all fall into that trap. We all in our own estimations and calculations work out what is good and what is not. Oh, well, this is acceptable, that's not acceptable. Oh, yes, I'll go this far. Oh, I'll go that far. And so Jesus asked this young guy, why do you ask such a question? What's going on in your head, young fella? And then he said, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, eternal life, Keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked. 
Which ones? What a dumb question. Don't you think that's a dumb question? Which one, Jesus? There's 10 of them, Jesus. He would have said all. But he says, which one? And Jesus answered, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Notice where he starts. Jesus didn't start with, do not use the Lord's name in vain. Jesus did not start with, don't worship any other gods. Jesus did not start with, keep the Sabbath. He didn't need to. The guy was hooked into that. The guy was a Jew. He believed all of that. Jesus didn't need to start there. And you men that sit here in my presence, some of you have been Seventh-day Adventists all your life. And you've only ever believed in one God. You've most probably never taken his name in vain. You've had no other gods before him. And you've kept the Sabbath. But Jesus started with, don't murder. He starts with that which relates to other people and not to God. Our problem as men, as men is living in this world, <laughs> living with other men, living with other people. That's our problem. And even as Seventh-day Adventists or Christians, we have that problem. And so Jesus says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honour your father and your mother and the length and, 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 and love your neighbour as yourself. And the young fella's chest puffs out. <laughs> God, I've got it all covered. I have kept all of these. The young man told him, what do I still lack? And Jesus went on to say, if you want to be perfect, or if you want to be in the place where you want to can eternally enter into my presence, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard that command, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. The sin of the young man was that he was putting the things that he had accumulated before the service of other people. He was accumulating his self-wealth, building his own little empire, and he was not meeting the needs of other people. He had forgot to serve. It's not... It's not that you keep the law that matters. Jesus is very clear about that. It's not that you keep the law that matters, but it is how you apply the principles of the law that is the most important. Fathers, when you say to your son, uh -uh, don't do that, have you demonstrated in your own life that it is something that they should not be doing. As you give direction to your daughters, are you giving them that direction in a, in a manner in which you yourself would live life? Or are the things that you say contrary to the things that you do? This was the rich young ruler's problem. Oh yes, I haven't murdered anyone. Oh yes, I haven't stolen anything. I don't need to, I've got all the wealth I need. But the question was, young man, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? I've given it to you. I've blessed you with the abundance. What are you doing with it? And the young man said, I need it. 
I need it. They don't need it. They don't need it. God, men, has blessed us with the privilege of the knowledge of him, of a God that loves and of a God that serves. And in giving the commands, he expresses that will to us. Because the last command, the one that Jesus didn't get the chance to say before the young man chipped in, because the young man knew that he would be pulled up on it, was don't covet. Don't covet. Don't desire that which is not yours. Don't covet. Don't seek more and more and more without meeting the needs of humanity. It's a hard one to take, man, I know. It's a, it's a pretty powerful statement, that passage in Matthew. But in the world in which we live, I believe it is perhaps the most crucial piece of scripture that we need to understand and we need to know because we're here as men to shape the next generation, to build a people of God, to build a church of God. And I pray that you'll not be like the rich young ruler who can't, who can't do what Jesus is able to help you to do. But I pray that you'll be honest men, faithful to the things of God, but that above all, you will serve humanity the way Jesus serves humanity. You're free to now to go and sit with each other and maybe have a discussion over these things as you have lunch. Just a couple of more places that I'd like you to go as we close off today. And the essential elements of an enduring individual is most beautifully expressed in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And I'd just like you to come here for a moment because we're going to finish off here in Colossians chapter 3. So let me read from verse 1 to verse 14. So if you have been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above, where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Oh, friends, don't let this world smother you. Don't let this world and all its issues drown you in despair and discouragement. Look up. Look up. Seek the things that are above is the first counsel. Set your minds on what is above and not on what is on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah and God. Oh, God's dealt with your sin problem. God's dealt with your lostness. He's taken care of all of that. And so, friends, we're not dead. We're alive. We're alive in Christ. We're alive in the Messiah and God. When the Messiah who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Wow. That's why the word of God encourages us to be built up in Christ. The next passage. The next couple of verses you'll most probably say, look, I've never been there and this has nothing to do with me. Therefore put to death whatever in you is worldly, sexually immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, greed, which is adultery. You most probably will say, ah, look, that's nothing. I have nothing to do with that. Well, only you will know. I won't know. 
I'm sure you wouldn't share things with me about that if these are your issues. But it says, have nothing to do with them. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you must also put away. Okay. We've shaken off the things of the world. We've shaken off the things that the law of God clearly say are not appropriate. Adultery and all of that sort of stuff. Stealing and murdering. We've put away all of that. But notice what comes next. Notice what comes next. Put away the following, anger. Anger. When were you last angry? When did that sense of feeling of anger rise up in you? Wrath. Wrath. When did you feel like wanting to seek revenge on somebody for someone having done something? Malice. Slander. Ooh. Ooh. When was the last time you stretched a story a little bit too far? (laughs) When was the last time in a conversation with someone you stepped beyond just sharing the truth and you exaggerated something a little bit, and all of a sudden the story has got to the point where a slander, slander is taking place. Filthy language from your mouth. When was the last time you, you might not have swore the, the F word or the other words that fit in that category, but when something else came out that should never have come out but was provoked because you weren't in the spirit at that time. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of his creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all in all. No one here can say you're better than me. And I cannot say I am better than you because this is my heritage and this is who I am. No. No one can enter into that place. Because no one is better than anyone else. We're all in it together. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy, loved, put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must Forgive. What a powerful passage in Scripture, isn't it? Powerful passage in Scripture. These are the things that are to be controlling and directing and and shaping our life. I've been challenged with them all my life. I've been challenged with these all my life. And God is still working on me for these are not easy things to develop but they are what God wants the verse 14 says above all love above all some translations will say above all put on love I want to tell you folks the word put on is added it's not in the original The original clearly says, the original clearly says, above all love. If you are putting and if you are tempted at any point to put love on, then you are able to take it off. 
you're able to say, oh yes, I'll love this person. I'll love all the people on this side of the church. But because I've been able to put it on, I can say, well, I don't love you people. I can take it off. We are to be living in the, in the essence of love every moment of the day, every moment of our life. Love is not something we can put on and take off. Above all love, Scripture says to us, the perfect bond of unity. Are we all united in the house of God today? Is there anyone here today who is feeling that at some point in time somebody said something to you that has offended you and from that moment on you've never talked to that person? I don't know what's gone on in the past. But if if there have been those kinds of issues and there have been things that have divided you and separated you from a close relationship, I just want to say go find a quiet place, sit down and put it out there in the open and if you have to, share a tear with each other and embrace each other, but please come to this place where you have put on love. We're going to wrap it up by looking at the next two verses. Okay, self-analysis. Ask yourself, what changes or what improvements do I need to make in my life today to become a better individual building for God? That's that's for you to play with. That's for you to play with. But I want to close by looking at the next two verses or the next three verses here in Colossians. Colossians 3. Let the peace... Let the peace of the Messiah to which you were also called in one body control your hearts. Be thankful. Be thankful you're alive. Be thankful that you are able to enjoy the blessings of God. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing praises and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Are you filled with gratitude? Are you overflowed with gratitude? I was excited when that doctor said to me, you got thoracic, um, what is it? (laughs) Outlet syndrome. I was excited. I've been tormented for six months waiting for something. It was a relief. But Jesus has done much more for me than that doctor's ever done. But are you living life full of gratitude? Full of gratitude in your hearts to God. Verse 17. And whatever you do, in the word in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May God bless us as we press on, as we reach out to God to be the person that God wants us to be. Maybe a little bit of pain along the way, But I know the blessings are there. Samuel. Hannah made the sacrifice. Samuel grew up to be a man of God. Samuel heard the voice of God. He responded to the voice of God. The rich young ruler was given every chance but walked away from God I pray that you will draw closer to God and that love will be all you ever dream of and seek may God bless you
Oh, loving Father, how sweet it was of you to answer the heartache of Hannah, the brokenness, the pain of which we were suffering. And you stepped into her life and you gifted her a precious son whom she gave back to you. And he devoted his life of service to you, but then he saw in his lifetime much heartache and much brokenness as the counsel he gave was not listened to. And then there was the rich young ruler who came to you with an inquisitive mind. What must I do? What must I do? Yes, his heart was breaking. His heart was hurting. He was wanting to know. But when the news was given to him, he said, uh-uh, that's too far for me to go. I can't go there. I can't do that. And he walked away. I pray that we will not succumb to that in our lives, but I pray that we will allow you, the wonderful Father, to heal all the heartaches and the brokenness within us and cause us to rejoice in you and you alone. I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.